Hello and welcome to another episode of Graham Hughes' Pubcast. And once again, we're in Circles Bar Cafe in York. Gin Bar and Cafe. Gin Bar and Cafe? We're not on gin. Because Are we we're drinking gin? No, we're on... No, I'm on San Miguel. San Miguel at the moment. Well, they've run out of San Miguel. So we've got a nice European beer, Stella. I like that you've stolen my top hat. Uh, I couldn't resist it. Why are you dressed up? Well, I'm dressed up like this because we're putting on a show in Manchester called The Sachte Resistance. And it's going to be on September the 29th. And it's a Sunday. And we're going to have a parade. We're going to have a March the Clowns. Because it's on the same day as the Conservative Party conference. So you've, you've got a few thousand clowns there already. That's what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to have a big event in the Castlefield Bowl called Euphoria, which is going to be a circus, cabaret, comedy and music uh, extravaganza. And we're also going to have a big top that's going to be the Festival of Europe. And it's going to have food and drink and activities from all over the EU27. So we and we, we're not going to mention the B word. No, we're not going to mention the B word. We're going to be focusing on everything that's been positive and a positive influence yeah. about membership of the greatest peace project of all time. Time. Yes, but, okay. for, but before before we go on, on, on any further about Euphoria, I'd like to introduce our guest today, who is Duncan Parsons. Hello. And he is a, a, your computer engineer, aren't you? Uh, amongst other things, yes. Because today we're going to be talking about Project Fear. Now, a few people have put in the comments, and I'm sure you're going to be putting other comments in there already, but, and we do read them. <laughs> So thank you for all the positive ones. Thank you for even the negative ones. I, 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 I quite like the ones where you've obviously got someone riled by presenting facts because they just call me a fat bloke and call you a stupid scouser or something. And you just think, hang on a minute. You know, if that's your comeback, you know, fair enough. But a lot of you have been talking about Y2K, which means year 2000, I'm told. Yes. Now, the thing is, is that a lot of the rabid Brexiteers and the rabid quitlings have been saying stuff like, well, year 2K, that was all a fizzer, wasn't it? Project Fear. Project Fear, because Y2K, we survived was, that and gonna, nothing went planes wrong. Planes were going to fall from the sky and, and, and we the toaster wouldn't out, work. We were going to run out of bread. Dogs and cats living together. And other things, other tragic things. We'll all die of typhoid or cholera, choose one form and all. And it was you. all bollocks. It, it didn't happen and, and, and it, we all got upset and scared for no reason whatsoever. Is that what happened, Duncan? Well, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> there, there are stories to tell. I mean, planes didn't fall out of the sky, but it did affect people uh, in very real ways, which I will talk about later. Um, but it was potentially overstated. Truth is, we will never know because uh, the code that was revisited would have needed revisiting anyway. Right. And so it needed to be checked. So. And a lot of changes were made, but we can talk about that as time goes on. How, how were you involved in the whole Y2K millennium bug project? Uh, I, well, I first heard about it in 96, 97 kind okay. of time. And that was the problem, wasn't it? Because a uh, computer code back in the day just had two numbers, 96, 97. But it needed to have 1996, 1997 yeah. in and order for it to turn over and not go back and to I think zero, Dun zero. I think it was Duncan and uh, <clears throat> who pointed out, it may have been someone else, but Duncan pointed out that the first time things started popping up uh, yeah. about this, was when the first of the 25-year mortgages were becoming computerized. And in 1976, all of a sudden, it was going to 01. And it's like, hang on, it's the wrong date well, or something. It, I don't it, know. I mean, It would go to 00 in uh, January 1976. Yeah, he had entered a new mortgage application, uh, which, when it said that it was going to mature in 1900, the head of the IT came down and... and stopped everything and wanted to check what the guy had done to make sure he'd inputted everything correctly and it was highlighted it's like well okay well this is an issue we will just have to bear it in mind and so it has been known about in the wild since then since the 70s but the first person to highlight it as an issue Carl was, Sagan was a chap called <laughs> Bob Beamer in 1958 Bob Beamer in, in 1958. He was involved with the programming and could see that there was a potential issue. Yeah. Um, 
and so he highlighted it to uh, compiler manufacturers, to software houses, to the US government, to ISO, the International Standards Organization, but it kind of fell on deaf ears, because in the 50s, um, and we used to memory being extremely cheap, and you can walk into a, a high street shop and get uh, a disk drive that will have four terabytes on it. It's like, that's a lot of little on and off switches. I've got two in my bag. Yeah? Yep. <laughs> Whereas, uh, and we're used to thinking in terms of megabytes and things like that. Gigabytes, yeah. A, a, a single byte is basically eight on and off switches. And in the 1950s, one of those on and off switches, one bit, cost a dollar. And so that's 1950s dollars. Yeah, so which it, had a greater buying power. Th yes, exactly. So I, I learned <coughs> something about this. I went to the uh, Johnson Space Center in um, Houston, and uh, they had rooms full of uh, computers. I thought you were going to say pornography there, though. <laughs> well, they probably did, but uh, they have rooms full of computers. Uh, did they call them mainframes or something? And, it's a style of computer. Uh, and and they, they have these massive rooms, but the amount of memory they used to send a man to the moon is the amount of memory that you can store one photo on on your iPhone or oh, something. Oh, you wish. Yeah. Less than that. Way well, less. there we go. So, <laughs> an, an average pocket calculator's got more memory. It's, it's staggering, isn't it? So what you're saying is, is memory was quite expensive. Yep, by the 60s uh, it had come down, so it was about $100 for a kilobyte. So if you open up Excel and just hit save without doing anything, that is about a thousand times bigger than... <laughs> so, so, so that's the price of memory, and so that's why they did everything they could to to save memory, so rather than uh, so putting two, a four-digit year... So two digits, it. would it was a cash-saving thing? Yeah. So Because yeah. when you're talking about bits, I think of drill bits because I'm a mechanical yeah. engineer no, and a it's, dinosaur. It's an on and off switch. Yeah. Computers are witchcraft to you, aren't they? They, <laughs> they are. <laughs> what all computers do is turn switches on and off, just right. a lot of them, very quickly. Right, OK. So, so this is... Have we got an expert here on this? We have got an expert software engineer. Software, a software. No, I, I, well, just, I just don't get out much. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk about the Millennium Bug. So, so, what would have happened if the problem wasn't addressed? Well, and how was it addressed? Uh, and it, you're right. I, I have got some notes. Uh, we don't do notes normally. We're normally well, wingers. Just, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, so. Hence the beer. Yeah, we say. win it, but we have an expert. Um, so, it was first highlighted as an issue uh, and then kind of sunk without trace in 1958. Um, it was being talked about through the 80s. Uh, in 1989, when the spec for Internet Mail was being talked about, very nascent internet, uh, someone had the foresight to make sure that all dates were written in, in four digits. So, it, m Internet Mail has never had the issue. By the mid-90s, work was already underway in reviewing codes. There were uh, Usenet groups for developers talking about uh, what was known then as the um, century date change problem. And it was in June... That's 19... not as catchy as Millennium Bug. No, uh, but it you was in... sort of marketing. In June 1995, someone coined Y2K, just as yeah. they were typing, and so that, that's where it was... Was that to save money? Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Certainly saved some typing. <laughs> um, but uh, the bigger organisations started getting involved. 96, 97, in early 97, the British Standards Institute right. issued a, um, uh, a kind of a conference paper to start talking about standards, which then got formalised in 1998. Um, and various other kind of large institutions but, started putting things in place, but the developers were already on it. The, so that's, that's, that's what I'd like to sort of touch on, because in effect, the the wheels of government and the wheels of standards, I do I do a lot with standards <coughs> in my job, but a lot of 
you know, those. It's funny because I have no standards. <laughs> <laughs> I have no to choose from. <laughs> but you have, you, you have a lot of, of of people saying, well, you know, it was all, it was all pie in the sky. Big wheels of government and big wheels like standards organisations, they tend to roll a bit slower. But so what you're saying is, is for maybe two years, four years, maybe even longer people were already developers and software engineers and like people who know this kind of stuff like you they were looking at these issues with year 2000 way before the government caught up oh, yeah. way before it appeared on BBC breakfast news yeah so could could it be said that there have been several years of planning yes yes right a, so does a very it... generous way one could say <laughs> yeah, a few years a few years yeah so in effect what you did, or, or pe people like you and, and your colleagues and you worked in these companies, you mitigated the risk. Yes, very much so. However, uh, there were issues, there were still issues with Y2K yeah. that people aren't aware of. Like yeah. different software like Linux went belly up because something to do with 1999, September 9999 yeah. or something. I, that wasn't... That, that was more an issue to do with uh, markers. People, data inputters would often use 9999 as kind of a, an anything date. It's kind of like if we don't know when something is going to end or we don't know the date, we'll just use 9th of September 99 because it, it looked sufficiently far in, in the future. But of but course. Then it came around and it, it, that wasn't so much a programming bug, it was more just a a formatting issue, ah, but it was right, an issue okay, right. for some companies and that whatever exception reports they may have run that month may have had some very strange results. So what would have happened if you and other software developers and programmers hadn't actually done something about it? Well, I'm, the first thing that comes up is to do with days of the week at a very basic level. First of uh, January 1900, was, I wrote it down, where do we have it? Was a Monday. Yeah. It was the 1st of January 2000. It was, it was a, Saturday. a Saturday. I bastard. So that, <laughs> if you had, for instance, uh, an automated <laughs> facilities management in yeah. your building where you had automated security and people with swipe cards and they might be only, if they're just a general worker, only allowed in Monday, Monday to, Friday. to Friday. If they came to swipe on a particular day, they might not be allowed in because the software had worked out that actually it's a Tuesday. Or oh, well, whatever that so, is. So, in, weekend or so in effect, it could have affected like uh, in, in engineering, in, in, a, in a car plant, for example, your order may, may say, have this equipment or have this component delivered on Monday, but the computer's saying it needs to come on as, uh, sorry, yeah. have it, schedule it for a different, for a different day. day. Yeah. So that could have brought just-in-time production but would to have, a halt. Would, 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 um, would, would something else is going to bring just-in-time production to a halt. Brexit! Go on. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, would planes have fallen out of the sky? Um, the onboard systems on an aeroplane, whilst they are time dependent, they're probably not calendar dependent in right. the same way. Right. And though messages they send may be time stamped, that's probably less of an issue. Where it would have caused more issues is at boarding gates. And where, baggage handling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's much kind of someone turns up with a ticket saying, I'm going to fly on this day, but the computer may say, Oh, actually, you know, that was printed on a computer system that has been fixed. And so that's showing the right sorts of days, but on our machine, it hasn't been fixed. And so oh, you're not yeah. actually on the passenger list because your date doesn't come up when we do a search on passengers for this flight on this day. So it could have, it wouldn't have been planes falling out of the sky, but it could have been people not being able to get on the plane. Travel, okay. because of date Travel disruption. So what had to be done? I mean, was it a case of going into all this code for all these different companies and all yep. these different things and basically saying, right, here's the date now, here's the new date? Uh, yeah, it was, some of the codes had been written in 
in the late 60s and early 70s, um, and so there were a lot of programmers who had been in their 20s and 30s back then, who would in the 90s be looking to, towards the end of their career, suddenly they've got to go back and look at these languages that they haven't touched for 25 years. Um, because they and, form the basis of... Yeah, and they hadn't been touched because, because essentially they worked. And so the yeah. banks, to do a large change like that, it's going to cost some money. If there's a change coming that will increase their profits, so it's like the bank deregulation in the 80s and stuff like that, they're all for that kind of change because it alters their bottom line. Yeah, it, in a it's going to get them more money coming in. Whereas if they've got to pay a whole load of developers to essentially stand still, yeah. then that's just a cost to the business that they don't want to have. And so it was left too late. And so you have these COBOL programmers and C programmers coming back, revisiting 30-year-old code. And so, you know, for them, it's a, it's a nest egg just before retirement. So and contractor rates for those types of programmers skyrocketed, it doubled, tripled over the years. They're desperate for that code yep. to be so, so all this planning went in, right, yeah. into computers. And they, this wasn't just done overnight, this took years. And how many people in this country, the United Kingdom, how many people were doing this? Uh, Have you got any idea? I mean, a stab in the dark costs. Oh, I don't know. It, it, thousands. It, it, yeah, it probably it was, wasn't. It was just a, Duncan and Major. It probably you. wasn't a five-figure <laughs> sum, but it would have been a four-figure sum in the states. It would have been much bigger because there were far more software. Well, companies. obviously you've got. Um, yeah. But over here, there would have been companies like Sage, uh, divisions of Honeywell and Microsoft that were over here. Um, so there were firms that had code to review. Um, and on that, all scale, and it would be from. Uh, mainframes and supercomputers, I don't know if the, the term Prey 2 means anything, you know, so you had big supercomputers they would have need looking at, all the IBMs, the Honeywells, the, the deck uh, mainframes would have need looking at, the mini computers down to the humble Windows 3 PC, which was still being run in the late 90s. Uh, handheld devices, there was a fashion for PDAs, you may remember they part oh, by the site yeah. organiser. Did that, you sent me a video I sent you a that. video. I'll send it through to you. Is there any way we can get that? Yeah, like, I'll put it on my channel. I'll put it on the channel. channel. You know. I think it's, but I put your LBC stuff on the channel. I can't monetize that. So I can't get me 87 pence a day. Because it's copyright. I thought LBC. it was 87 pence a year. Oh no, it's 87 pence a year. Well, the, there is a chap <laughs> who has an unpatched sign organizer. Yeah. And he took a short video of the Millennium issue in action. So oh, he right. set okay. the date to 10 seconds. Uh, before midnight in the end of 1999, and you watch it roll over to Monday, the 1st of January, 1900. And it goes, I haven't been invented yet, and pops <laughs> out of existence. Um, but what I would say is that uh, people say, oh yeah, the planes didn't fall out of the sky and everything was fine. But the truth is, in the large part it was because of the work that were done, but there were cases where it wasn't. Ooh, and tell us you, about that. If you lived in Reading, for instance, yeah. in the early 2000s, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> but there was We've got a good festival. <laughs> yes. I'll let you get to lead to that. So not in January. <laughs> The January to March 2000, yeah. uh, there was an issue with printing of tickets that would put a date of 00, zero JNR00 zero zero because it just didn't know what to do. For, with, the, for the Reading Festival? Not for the Reading Festival, oh. just as I say, keep up. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there, anyway, there, there were tickets that were printed that wouldn't work with the automated gating system. And so that caused disruptions. And on the train, so people going onto the train or coming off the train put their ticket in, yeah. and it, the gates wouldn't open, so they had to have a manual override. So it caused disruption in people movement. So that's a simple thing. Yeah. In Japan, uh, it was recorded that uh, an alarm went off in a nuclear power plant that was put down to a Y2K. Well, you you don't want alarms in nuclear Absolutely. power plants, I'm, that's pretty bad. Unless you're well, Russian, then yeah, you just I'm, ignore them. Yeah. <laughs> Watch Chernobyl, um, it's really good. 
in America, there were some uh, lottery machines that failed, but the most striking one that comes to mind happened in Sheffield, where 154 pregnant ladies were erroneously sent um, the wrong uh, results from Down syndrome tests. Oh, Why me? Uh, where people were put into high-risk groups where they weren't in high-risk groups, or they were put in low-risk groups, when but they, they were weren't, and it was all to do yeah. with the calculation of their age, and it was put down to a verifiable Y2K bug that was in the system that hadn't been patched. And as a result of that, there were four children uh, born who had Down syndrome, uh, which was unexpected. They'd been put in the low risk category. Right. But even if they had truly been low risk, that's still a determination of probability. And they, it, that could have been what was going to happen anyway. And I'm sure those children have been a massive blessing to those families. Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, nobody... But on the, the other side, there were two ladies who decided to terminate their pregnancy. Based on those... Based rates. on having been given erroneously uh, information. Now, you, you may think 154 women out of all the things that could have gone wrong, it's like, well, that's a, a drop in the ocean. But... Truth is, you try telling that to 154, it's like they wouldn't fit in this room that we're in. Yeah. But every one of those is a human being, it's yeah. a story. If you tell them that Y2K was a non-issue, they'd have a different story to tell. Yeah. Can you tell us what you actually did? Me, personally, um, I had uh, various databases that I had written uh, for, I was working largely for utilities contractors at the time, People like Morrison Construction, Babti Group, uh, did some work with AMEC, um, who they all had large contracts with Thames Water, Southern Water, Anglian Water, Transco. And so where I had written code for them, I had to review it, stuff that was written in uh, VB, stuff that was written in Pascal. Um, and was using Microsoft Access as a database. Did you just think of VB as in the B? I I think of Victoria <laughs> Bitter. <laughs> oh, no, this was Microsoft's Visual Basic. Sorry, I was... <laughs> no, I was I, thinking I was, VB I could, as I in see your face. I'm thinking of beer. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh, I, I was talking Australia to the geeks in the audience there. Yeah. Um, so I had to review all my code uh, and make <coughs> sure that everything was uh, four-digit date And did you, did you have to review other people's code? Because um, that would piss me off if I here and there, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, that every... <laughs> Fix people, other people's I mean, mistakes. It probably yeah. happens, kind of, if you get architect's plans or things like that. Right, you know, okay. Yeah. And you receive things from another architect, and it's like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> um, and so there, there was a, a, a fair bit of... I, I had some other people's code to review, and there was... It was like, oh, that's an interesting way of doing it. I wouldn't have done it like that. Um, but you still fix it, because there's a job to do. Um, but also I was involved in uh, writing compliance statements for a few different companies I was working for. So I had to uh, write their statement that said, uh, all our machines are up to date to the best of our knowledge, uh, which for me involved going around every PC in all the different offices that I was involved with and sticking a floppy disk in, running some programs that would update the the fundamental kind of input-output uh, system within every computer. So how um, long were you doing all of this? Because I know, but In terms of the programming, it probably took me about four or five months because right. I but, only had so much to review. And in terms of visiting every computer, I could probably reckon it probably took me about a quarter of an hour per computer to run stuff, make sure that all their software, but how, office, how, CAD, uh, yeah, but so, so, so um, but, but what I'm saying is how, how long were you involved with Y2K? I mean, so were you involved for three years, four years, five years, oh, two right. years, three um, months? Talking about it with people for about four years, but in terms of me actually sitting down and doing stuff, because my boss said, this needs doing, it was probably about 18 months. 18 months. Um, but I'd known about it for right. a long time before then. Yeah, and obviously there were other people doing this before you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and especially, I, it's like Microsoft had to <laughs> review everything for a, 
Uh, Novell was a very popular operating system, Novell, that was so another they one would that they were reviewing all this. So I had to install patches on servers around different places to make sure that all the networks, date stamps were correct. Um, so yeah, it involved lots of small subsystems and making sure that I had the latest updates yeah. from Microsoft, from Lotus, because Domino and 123, they all needed to do. Things that people haven't talked about now for nearly 20 years. Because I remember they, Lotus 123. Yeah. Well, I, I remember there's Lotus a, Notes. There's a story with one, two, three. The reason that uh, Microsoft Excel is now the dominant spreadsheet is partly because of a Y2K problem to do with Lotus one, two, three. That Lotus uh, in the early part of the 90s, especially, was the dominant spreadsheet. Yeah. yeah. And Excel was just this fringe thing, as far as they were concerned. So they didn't write any import specs. So if you were using Excel. Uh, you could import one, two, three files because Microsoft wanted to make inroads. So they had allowed you to read one, two, three files. But if you're on one, two, three, you couldn't read Excel. And also, Excel couldn't write one, two, three files to begin with. But when they were looking into uh, the spec of it, they, they found that there was a problem to do with the leap year uh, in 1900 because there had been a misinterpretation of the Gregorian calendar, which states that you have a leap year every four years, apart from on a century. On a century, unless, unless the century is divisible century. Yeah, by, by 400. 400. And so, uh, <laughs> very good. <laughs> so Lotus had got it wrong. And Microsoft ah. had to program against that to make sure that they had compatibility with one, two, three files. And so, I don't know if you have looked at the property pages or the options in Excel That's 20 how I years ago. That's spend my uh, Friday night. But there was a little checkbox saying, uh, use 1904 date standard, and that was yeah. to do with bypassing, just kind of getting round this issue that 123 had. That so they had given a leap Excel, year in 1900 yeah. when there wasn't a leap year and in so 1900. And so once Excel could both read and write 123 files, then it didn't matter if you were using 123 or not. So everyone's then switched to Excel because it was cheaper, had better features and things. But before that, they held off because 123 is what everyone else used. But when it didn't matter oh. whether you used 123 or not, that's where Excel became dominant. And that's how we use Microsoft that's Office such everything. A tiny thing. And it largely comes down to a Y2K issue. But you so, know, we were talking about a stone in, in, in a, pebble, a pebble. A pebble in, in, the, in the pond. Yeah. In the mill pond. And, and the ripples. Yeah. That's a tiny little thing. Brexit, compared to that, is a fucking meteorite. Yeah, it is, isn't it? You know, it's it, I mean, it's just that killed out. the dinosaurs. You said we weren't going to swear in this one. Well, the kids have left. <laughs> <laughs> there were young people in the pub, so I was trying to mitigate my... But, but, the, but it, it is, isn't it? It's this Brexit, the no-deal Brexit in particular, isn't just the pebble in the pond. It is a meteor yeah. wiping out the pond and the town that yeah. the pond is in. Yeah, because you know, it's, it's so Vesuvius, much. It? it is. It's There's written, so much is complexity. A great word to say. So to Vesuvius. say that you know we look at one, <laughs> one little bit of programming where they got something a little bit wrong, i.e., 1900 being put down as a leap year when it actually wasn't a leap year. Oh, no, 1900 was a leap year. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Sorry, 2000, 2000 was. was a leap year. So that was yeah. another thing where the code needed to be checked to make sure that uh, there wasn't going to be a date discrepancy come March. So when so when you hear people like Andrea Lothsom <coughs> and uh, Jacob Rees... Rees Slob. Rees Slob. Uh, Rees Smog. Rees Smog of the town. Bring back Smog. Yeah, and when you hear them say... Oh, if this is Project Fear, look at Y2K, fuck all happened. Does that wind you up a bit? Because you, you, you're a pretty calm kind of guy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have my moments, but, you know, it's... I, th I think it's... Do you swear at question time? I, I don't watch question time. Like, <laughs> like, life is too long, long to watch question time. You need to maintain your peace for a long time. Right. So it's, it's just not worth it. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it does annoy me because it's, it's willful ignorance. It's being 
unwilling to look at the fact and do any research. Now, if someone's done some research and come to some conclusions uh, You'll that are wrong, it. yeah, it's like, yeah, that, that's all right, because at least they're open to have done some research. Oh. But when they just base it on, it's fine, like, well, I didn't see anything, but that doesn't mean it wasn't there. And it's interesting you say that, because some people have done research about the implications of Brexit. Yeah, one the of government. Them is <laughs> well, the other one is Patrick Menford, who Jacob Rees Mogg. Economist of Brexit. He's the economist of Brexit, and he said it will destroy our agri food sector and, and, and it will destroy our manufacturing sectors. Well, and you've got to respect his honesty. They'll, they'll but he's done research down. and said. They'll have to be wound down. This, yeah. He's done the research, so in effect, you respect him for saying it. The guy's an asshole, but you know. You, you, <laughs> Duncan, was that the end of it? Um, no. Um, there were still date-related problems. Uh, in 2010, there was an issue to do with SMS, text messages. Uh, one of the reasons that, uh, we, that they went with having two-digit years rather than saying, well, we could have a year as a baseline and then add and subtract things to it was that there's additional maths involved in that and dates largely are static. Something happened at that point, so you don't need to do a th arithmetic on it. So they used a storage format that uh, was ideal for sending to a printer so that you could kind of show it. And equally with SMS, they used that same system. Rather than having a baseline date, say, 1900, or, or Unix uses the 1st of January 1970. So all your Macs or iPhones and things like that, they have a baseline date yeah. of 1970 and Does everything it? is added. And, yeah. So there is an issue with that. that so, yeah, you won't be able to find it. It's very deep. Oh, um, I've got a photo of Kyle. Is it, the first, is it the 1st of January 1970? 1970, yeah. That's and the so start the, of the world. So the, like, there, is, <laughs> there, there is an issue for 2038 to do with Linux-based operating systems. Uh, using what's known as 32-bit code, but with most things have now moved to 64-bit. High geeks. Um, I, it, it's I a problem Drill that has gone out, but a real-world example of Y2K still being an issue 10 years later was SMS, uh, text messages, using this date format, even though kind of it uh, was 10 years afterwards, you'd think it would have been patched. But Windows Mobile, uh, misinterpreted how the dates were stored and so rather than showing something as being from 2010 it would show it as from 2016 just the way that uh, the representation in the byte, yeah. in the on so, and off switches but what you're saying and is PlayStation 3s were affected by the same issue <laughs> so in 2010 they would show dates as 2016 so what you're saying is that despite all that Good planning that Andrea Lothsom yeah. says didn't happen. There were holes in the net, and Brexit is a big net with great big holes. That's the first time I've ever heard you swear. Um, <laughs> it's the Swiss cheese model, isn't Brexit it? Brexit makes you swear. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's Emmental, my dear Watson. Oh. <laughs> oh, that bad joke. Oh, back to the studio. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, that is good. Yeah, that's a good one. I love a good cheese joke. Anyway, so... I pay you in cheese. You do? Mm. That was Dan Fine Cheese you gave me last time. Okay, do you want to? Are we getting off the subject? Yeah. Get out your Sunday Times there. This is it's the not Sunday my Times. Sunday Times. Alan Pond, my neighbour, gave me this. We're not giving money to Murdoch. We're not. Um, Sunday Times here. Operation Chaos. Whitehall secret no deal plan leak. Yeah. And, and then, if that's a but, code word for what they're doing, uh, it's but, a poor one. But it's not just the front page. It's one, This is not two, Project Fear. That's what three, it's four. Five pages inside the Sunday Times. And this is a lot of the stuff that we've been talking on Three Blacks in the Pub and the podcasts over the last year, yeah. over a year, yeah. saying this is mathematics. It's as simple as this, right? You have a product, it's a, it's, it's a beer, okay? You sell that to your customers for a certain amount, depending on where you're sending it. A quid. Whatever, yeah. And you make a certain amount of profit on that. What Brexit does is it puts a tax on this. 
to be sold to your customers if they're not in the UK. It also puts a tax on the ingredients in this if they're coming in from anywhere else, which destroys your bottom line. That's just mathematics. It's not it's project simple fear, fact. it's just a fact. It's just, that's the way businesses work. They have to make a profit. Suddenly, you're paying an extra 20% for your materials, for your ingredients. You're paying, your customers are paying an extra 20%. There's other places to get beer. It's we're not the only place in the world that makes beer. Not that this is a British beer. This is Stella, but you know. Well, it's it, it's the same principle. But we have comments, uh, Duncan. I don't actually. Uh, this is British. It's just yeah. Pre, it's pre, a, pre, it's, pre it's, pre it's, pre it's a be Belgian market of beer, isn't it? Yeah. But we have comment sections on our YouTube videos. Yes. Some, some of them are not too complimentary. They're always quite entertaining. But someone was asking me. They were saying, well, why would the EU put tax? on what they want to sell to us. You've got the wrong end of the stick, with all due respect. If I want to sell my beer to him, he gives me a pound, I give him the beer. Hey. He then wants to sell it to you, but under WTO rules, he has to apply a tariff. And that tariff goes to the government Goes to the my government. country. If, if he's exporting his beer, he's the UK and I'm in the EU, if he's exporting his beer to me, I have to put a tariff on it. It's not on who's selling, it's on who's buying. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we have trade deals. And to make, to make it zero. To make it zero. And to get these trade deals can take, say Canada plus, two years minimum. We've not even started, we've rolled over a few. But the, the EU-Japan trade deal took 10 years to negotiate, I think. And this isn't happening. So when they're talking about no deal and preparations for no deal, and they're saying, well, Y2K, and, and we've, we've, we've touched on this because it really annoys me when people say, oh, Y2K, it never happened. It did. I mean, Duncan worked on it with a lot of his colleagues and people in his game, whatever it is, and he... <laughs> the witchcraft, that <laughs> is, the, the witchcraft, he worked on the witchcraft, <laughs> got his crystal ball out and did stuff. <coughs> you know, fill your boots. But thousands did it, and it cost an astronomical sum. So when you get Worldwide. these- Worldwide. Well, well, but also in the UK. The difference with Brexit is that we're actually applying this to ourselves. So we're spending all this money, oh, billions. Yeah. And, and, and it's not a fault, it's a feature. Yep. And we've got 10 weeks. That's all the We've got like 10 weeks to prepare. What is it, 73 days from today? Well, we've agreed to roll over our like trade it. deal with uh, Papua New Guinea and the Faroe Islands. There's a lot of money there. <laughs> but it, it comes down to hard mathematics, and it's just like just voting against the sun coming up. Yeah. It's, it, it's King Canute sitting on the beach commanding the tide. Yeah, that, that, that's a bad example, uh, historically speaking. Why, because he sorry. was showing how he couldn't command the tide? No, because it's not for full. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> but, but then, you know, don't invite a pedant. This, this is why we're not on Facebook. This is why we're not on Facebook. It's the internet. <laughs> come pedants, come on, mate. <laughs> there is some good news. On the 19th of February, I have it here, Michael Gove says said tariffs would be put in place to protect UK farmers. Okay. This was after Jacob Rees-Mogg, who wears a hat like this, yeah. said, we'll just drop tariffs. And now Michael Gove, is, what's his job title? Henchman? He was, he was uh, environment and farming. Uh, yeah, but what's his job title state, now? Uh, henchman. Henchman. Yeah, but he is now saying all of this stuff in here is Project Fear. All the stuff Nigella. in yeah. <laughs> all the stuff in Oh yeah, Nigella. Yeah. All the stuff that was leaked that in a report that was commissioned by, by the, government, the government for the government. And they say it's old news. It came out on the first of August. That report was issued on the 1st of August. Do you reckon this is like one of those things where you're making a, a film and halfway through you realise it's absolutely terrible, you're making a turkey and you think, I know, we'll throw more money at it, that'll make it better. Sort of like Lake, Lake Placid. I think that started off as a serious no, film. No, Monster Trucks, that's my new favourite film. Monster Trucks, the 2017 film with Rob Lowe about monsters that live in trucks. 
and that had more money invested in it than the British car industry has had all year. All year. The entire Nine, British car industry. 90 million pounds versus this year. A film you've never heard of. I've heard of it. It was on Netflix last week. <laughs> <laughs> you see it? That's the film That's Graham, the was, film talking Graham about. was talking about. It's had more money invested in it. I didn't know how to get into it. I just saw it on the Netflix thing, but I don't know how to get into it. But how do you fight? Mathematics. I mean, there's this idea that, oh, well, economists get it wrong. And, and the, the CBI wanted us to join the euro. Oh, <laughs> how wrong they were as the pound tanks. As the pound the euro. tanks, yeah. Uh, and, and they say, well, um, you know, economics, it, it, it's, it's like voodoo. You can't predict. You can't well, predict. Look, I think, didn't the government... People were saying, well, you know, there's going to be a recession the moment we leave to, uh, vote to leave the EU. The recession didn't happen because an expert, we've got one here, but in a different game, an expert in financial circles injected billions of capital, billions of pounds in capital into the UK economy in something called quantitative easing. So the that was Mark Carney, wasn't it? The that was Mark the Bank Carney. of England. Yes. Who's, who's a Remainer. Remainer. Saboteur. Saboteur. Yeah, how dare you keep on our economy on an even keel. Well, when it comes to the economy and how business works, even if things stay exactly the same, so you, you have the same number of customers and they can get your product in exactly the same way, there's no hold-ups at the ports or anything like that, all that doesn't happen, right? You've still got that flow, even if that was the case. WTO taxes kicking in will destroy your bottom line. All of this stuff is so interwoven. That's what amazes me. That people saying, oh, no deal won't affect this business. It, it actually could because a lot of our refining capacity is gone. So the fuel to power the tractors and trucks that the potato farmers use, a lot of that is brought in. We, we, we do refine fuels here, but we also import pre refined uh, we, we import refined goods as we, well. We import more fuel than we export. Yeah, but it's refined already. But we also import crude oil, and we and we also uh, import more food than we export. Yes, and we, we import about thirty percent of our food. No, fifty percent. I thought I thought it was thirty, but I'll I'll take my uh, and eighty-seven percent of our fresh fruit and veg comes from the EU. Yeah, and that changes through the year as well, because obviously in winter months we're having to get more from Southern Europe. Because there's the worrying thing that kind of with the no deal preparation that some people say, oh yeah, well we can grow our own food because we did that during the Second World War. And it's like, well, if you just take that, you know, everything else aside, in the 40s we had more green spaces that could be turned over for arable use. There were fewer mouths to feed. And even then, kind of with the war on, we didn't manage to... No. to feed everyone, even Germany. with all this extra Germany. My, my grandfather was in the, the Royal Navy. Yeah, and, and the Atlantic his, Convoy was a real his, term. Yeah, he yeah. protected the Atlantic Convoys from yeah. and, 39 and to 45, all six years of the war, he was in just, active service. Yeah, it wasn't just to sink uh, tanks and planes that were getting imported no, from America. it was America. to, it was food to in, starve in, us yeah. into submission. That's what the Nazis were trying which, to do, yeah, starve which us. We, it eventually ended up doing with the Germans in the First World War. Ah, but we won, so that's okay, apparently. <laughs> yeah, nobody won <laughs> the German War. Yeah. It's going to be the, that's the, that's like the tagline of Brexit the movie, isn't it? Yeah. We won. We won, get over yeah. it. So it's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the whole idea of we can grow our food is it's like, ah, yeah, but... we have brownfield sites that you're not going to turn those into arable land and stuff. No, it's no. Just, and and the, like... the old green fields we've built houses and offices on. But like I say, even if there was just a 1% chance that your grandchildren would go to bed hungry in the fifth biggest economy in the world as a result of what we're doing, Why? that's not a risk that I would take. No. Sorry for being all, like, you know, conservative. I, 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 want, I want my family to be <laughs> yeah. better off than me. Do, do you know, my, my grandfather was killed in the war, and my father has never had any animosity towards uh, Germany. 
because uh, my grandfather was killed in North Africa. Um, but he, <laughs> how does he feel about North Africans? He doesn't feel anything. But he, 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 my father is a, he's an old. Uh, he, he was in the merchant navy for years. He had crews mm. from different. He, he's been all over the world. He, uh, you know, he, he had crews from everywhere. Never felt any animosity about it. But my father, we, we talked about this in a, in another video in the earlier video about being a self-made man. My father was a self-made man. His mum died when she got the telegram. So he was adopted by his aunt, and he met Sorry, her. what? His mum died when she got, got the to... telegram saying that, that dad uh, husband had, had, died. had been killed on the and 6th she, of May, 1943. She... Private Dennis Lee is commemorated at Majors El Bab, and my grandmother died very quickly, like the day after oh she got God. the telegram. It's literally dying of a broken heart. Died of a broken heart. She would. He, 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 dad and his sister were then raised by someone we used to call Grandma Ward, which was his aunt. And she, you know, so she'd got her own kids. She, you know, she did the best she could. So when people say, oh, self made man, all that, my father was, he, he, he did. He, he worked hard at school. He got an apprenticeship in the Merchant Navy with Shell. Uh, he became an, an engineer and officer with Shell tankers. And he is a lifelong Tory voter, a, a lifelong Daily Mail reader, and he is now voting Liberal Democrat and wants to leave the UK because he says we're screwing it up for young people. And he's pointing at us saying young people. The guy's 83 and I'm, probably I'm a bit not, senile. <laughs> you know, but, you know, we want, he wanted us, me and my brother, to have a better opportunity in life he wants my daughter to have a better opportunity in life than him and better and the legacy we're leaving these people is going to bed hungry in a country that's not at war because people like Mark Pudding Francois say oh you know we won the war and then they won't the listen thing. to experts anything anything that we say anything we get someone like Duncan on 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 board to say, listen, hey, the Y2K thing was a major issue it and it needed, needed to be addressed. And due to the hard work and very noisy bus just went down. <laughs> <laughs> you say, I get distracted. <laughs> but people say it, what, Y2K wasn't a thing. It was a thing. He, I prod him, he's real, he's not computer generated. He's a real person, and there were lots of people like him who actually put this problem, and they worked hard, and they didn't get it all right, but yeah. they got a hell of a lot of it right, and it wasn't in two or three years of people like Boris Johnson going, bah, piss, yeah, 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 blah, blah. what, <laughs> you know? I mean, this is one of the things as well, it's all, the, the preparations are being done to mitigate. That's the word that you've got to bear in mitigate, mind. Mitigate, yeah. Mitigate the disaster that is Britain tearing up its trade agreements with every, every single country. other country in the world. Every single one. Every, all of them. They're, they all because go because all our trade agreements are for, via the EU. So we have to renegotiate them all from scratch with every other country in the world. And instead of coming Good luck from... On that. Instead of coming from an economic block that represents over 500 million people with the GDP, PPP, of over $19 trillion, we're going to be a country of 66 million with a GDP, PPP, of around 2.6 trillion. How much weight do you think we're going to have when we're trying to get a good trade deal with not individual countries? Because don't forget, we don't necessarily make trade agreements with individual countries we make them with trade associations like the EU like Mercosur, Mercosur like, like Camicom As like ASEAN. ECOWAS like ASEAN you make a deal with the entire block and if that block's GDP is much bigger than yours they are the senior partner to that trade negotiation they get to say the rules a lot more and it, 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 it becomes very quickly a tyrannical power agreement, yeah. right? It's a bit like, imagine if you're a 20-something budding travel filmmaker and the BBC asked you to make a TV series for them 
featuring you that you get to film. You'll think, oh my word, that sounds incredible. And it's going to be broadcast in India and in China and in Australia and New Zealand. Over 2.5 billion people are going to see this show. What do you say to that? Do you say, oh, well, you know, you're going to have to pay me a bit more. You say yes. Yeah, I'll do it. You say yes, I'll do it. But the people working for the BBC don't seem don't understand how tyrannical that relationship is. Yeah. Because you have really no choice. You're yeah. like, this is the course that I want to take in my life. I will literally do this for no money. Yeah. Not that I know anyone that happened to. Anyway, moving swiftly on. <laughs> so, uh, Project Fear, when it's uh, compared to Y2K, Y2K, we know that that is bullshit because there was a lot of preparation and money put into Y2K planning and making sure that it didn't happen, mitigating the, the problems. Now, Brexit is a massive problem. It's a massive headache for everybody. Everybody, in every walk of life in this country, if you're a child, if you're a pensioner, if you own a business, if you're a politician, if you're not a politician, if you don't care about politics, if, if you just want to get, continue living your normal life, it's a problem that has to be solved by people who are going to have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money invested in solving the problem that doesn't need to happen. And, and the truth is, they could have done the work if they wanted to. Yeah, because but there was the referendum in 1975, so I, potentially there's 40 years, and then, I don't know if you remember in the late uh, 80s... Oh, we were, were on the ball in 1992. I, I, I was drunk. So <laughs> I, you, you mentioned 1992, there was the prep... In, I remember in 1988 there were adverts on television about the borders opening in 1992, yeah, the, and there was, the, there was the Enterprise Initiative, yeah. I don't know if you remember the advert with the whoosh, yeah. like that. Uh, so that was all linked skin. together with preparing for the open borders and the freedom of movement, and so 1992 came, and if you start that as saying, okay, well, we're Maastricht signed and things like that, uh, if we're going to start from there and people still want to leave the EU, yeah. they can then look at what's the legislation we have to look at, how can we plan for this, if we're going to leave, we're going to look at, need to look at borders. They could have done the work. Leaving the EU could have been planned in the same way that Y2K was planned, but they chose not to. And I think and this, that's this the thing that annoys me, because it's like, Political decision, it's like, yeah, fashion's just, it, it, it's annoying that it's come to this, but they could have planned, and the fact that it has been, again, willful ignorance, it's like, that is not a way to run a country. That is not a way to... Well, to run a banana republic. Present your <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Never mind dial, the fifth you know. biggest economy in the world. You know, this guy's yeah. pretty good. I mean, I think you should sack me and have him in more than <laughs> that. Is, yeah. I really wouldn't. <laughs> but, but the thing... The thing is, I mean, people go on about the referendum, and I was talking to one of my elderly relatives who's very much pro-Brexit, as opposed to my father who's very much against Brexit. And she, she says, oh, well, we, we didn't vote in 1975 for all this integration and blah, blah, blah. And actually, you look at the referendum campaign, I think it was Edward Heath, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, but, he said there will be closer political union. Yep. There, there it, was will... the, it was in the pamphlet that went to everyone's houses. So, it was, uh, if you look at Hansard from 1973, you will find that it was mentioned in the debates. If you yep. look at televised debates leading up to the uh, referendum, <coughs> it was there. I have watched the YouTube videos where it's mentioned on BBC uh, programmes about it. Yeah, you know, yeah, it, but the we, research is there. But we needed the in, narrative, didn't in, we? In the fairness, betrayal. they didn't have the internet in the 1970s. So if you missed something on TV, there weren't video recorders to go back and watch it. But the pamphlet was there, and you yeah. could go and ask your mate down the pub. And that's what the whole well, point go, of these videos Go to the are. library and get the McAfee show and look at the old yeah. newspapers yeah. at the time, yeah. who were saying, including including the Daily Mail, saying, hooray, that we're going to stay in the EEC and, and it's going to be a closer political union. I, I, I would never normally quote Thatcher, but, you know, I have found myself at times recently yeah. quoting Thatcher. Yeah. You know, the things that she was saying about how, actually, it's a very good thing. And it was. And it, it was. still is. It, and, it, and it, it still will be. And the, and it the, will be. We just the, may not the be arguments, part of it. The arguments that are being used on the other side are the same 
bloody arguments they use against doing anything about climate change. You know, they're, they're presented with all these facts, all this re carefully researched facts from people who have dedicated their lives to actually going out to the Arctic and drilling the oil for cause, actually dedicated their life to putting up weather balloons, put, you know, dedicated their life to traveling around the world on a boat with, with a thermometer in the water to monitor this stuff. And then people just go, I don't believe it. I don't believe it, yeah. NASA, the very people who put man on the moon are lying to us. Worse than that, the Royal Society <laughs> The Royal Society, founded by Edmund Halley and, and Robert Hooke, and these amazing scientists like uh, Isaac Newton. And you turn around, oh, the Royal Society just lying to us? They're making it up. Do you know who I believe? The Sun. Yeah, the Sun. Rupert Murdoch's arsewipe of a but rag. Isn't this, isn't this a thing in the left and the right, a denial of reality? It is. It is. The denial of, of the facts that are given in front of yeah. you, I, I, I choose not to believe that fact. The arrogance of that yeah. pisses me off. So we've got all these people in government who are saying that they know more than the man who runs Jaguar Land Rover. Jaguar Land Rover is owned by Tata, who also own a steelworks in Port Talbot. Right? and you've got the government, you've got MPs who, who are career politicians saying he's wrong. Yeah, and they know more than the governor of the Bank of England, they, they know more than and the guy who used to run Sainsbury's. You've got a man here who was involved with Y2K. Which was actually a thing that which was to actually be a sorted. Thing. And Andrea Loathsome is saying, or whoever is saying, well, planes never fell out of the sky. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to have to wrap up. All I want to say is Project Fear. Do you know what Project Fear is? It's putting out a billboard with refugees, Muslim refugees, Muslim, Muslim refugees saying breaking yeah. point. That's Project Fear. That's Project putting Fear. out stuff on YouTube and on, on Facebook saying that Turkey is going to join the EU. Project that Fear. is Project Fear. This, this is, is Project, Project Reality. Fact. Yeah. Fact. Project yeah. Fact. Anyway, Duncan, thank you so much for coming on board for thank you, Duncan. a podcast. I think, drank have, tea. I think he should be in this more than <laughs> me because he knows what he's talking about and presents himself very well. Yeah. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> did, you want, did, you, did you want to say anything just before we go? Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's been, it's been a gas, guys. Okay. <laughs> it's been a gas. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And, and we're just going to give a thumbs up to the EU. Here's the EU. it, 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 it. It can't just be me. It's it, it's it, it's it, it's it. It's put me off me tea. If I hear that word again, I think I might explode. I'm a European, not some trumped up toad. But while the UK still exists, and while the PM's a clown, we're putting on a carnival in old Manchester town. With lights and music and ooh la la, marching bands and cabaret, with blimps and tents and elephants. I hear it's the Mancunian way. Or maybe that's never given up. Or is that a northern thing? Because just between you and me, I can't hear a big lady sing. So let's build something beautiful, a monument of persistence. Come one, come all, to the Cirque de Resistance.